Hey y'all, this is David, the Georgia photographer, and I'm doing a quick live stream. I've only got a little while before I have to go to Bible study tonight, so I figured I'd take a few minutes to chat with you guys about this new super hot rod camera Sony released. Seems that they decided to scuttle the A7S III and jumps straight for the jugular with an A7R4 with a daggum super huge sensor in it. <sighs> All right, now that that intro is out of the way, I'm waiting for some people to log in. <laughs> but that's incredible that the, uh, I think, it, well, I had the specs up, but then I used this to actually stream with, so I've lost them. Hey, how you doing? Thank you for logging in. Uh, have you seen this new camera that Sony's launched? That A7R4 is a beast. If it doesn't like catch on fire from overheating it'll be a monster <laughs> but that uh, that's an enormous was it a 60 megapixel sensor i think it was all in it uh, it's incredible 4k uhd 30 frames it had basically they put enough in it that you could do videography with it and it would still do the job for that, plus take insane photographs. Now, I don't think I got new glass. No, it, um, I didn't see any mention of that, but uh, what I, I saw the beginning of the press release, but of course I had a lot of stuff to get done today, so I didn't get to watch the whole thing. But, you know, of course they went on with their platitudes about how they innovate and they know stuff before the customer does and, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, switching over from Nikon. Yeah, you know, who was it? Petapixel just did their big all-inclusive 70 to 200 test and Nikon still owned them. And they said that the the G Master 7200s, you might get a good one, you might not. And like even with the Gen 2s, they still don't have like super reliable operation or something about clarity or something. They, they just, they said that Sony isn't quite there yet with their glass. I thought that was kind of interesting. But, huh. I don't know if you can tell it or not, but there's apparently clouds going by, and it's getting dark and then bright, and then dark and then bright. I think the camera, I've got it set to auto, so it's adjusting its exposure to compensate nonstop. But, yeah. But yeah, I've jumped in on this just to chat about it for a minute. Um, I saw the, uh, who is it, Adorama or somebody made a post about it on Instagram and they throwed the specs out and, dude, uh, it's pretty hot. <laughs> I want to say it was 60.1 megapixels. It was a crap load of megapixels, like far and above, like even more than the GFX 50, you know, that Fuji medium frame sensor. It's like way more than it. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah, if they can keep it from catching on fire, you know, that's a lot of processor net, um, power that you're gonna have to have. Isn't that... I'm curious to see, yeah, they apparently they've done something to improve IBIS as well, because now they're calling it, it said five axis image stabilization, and then the word inside is all caps. So I'm assuming that to be, you know, like a, not trade name, a, uh, what do you call that? Uh, uh, you know, it's like a logoed word, something to that effect, where like they're they're branding the word inside as some kind of a new version of Ibis, but apparently it's got better Ibis than the previous versions. <sighs> I had a mosquito bite me on the back of the leg through my trousers, and now it's itching like mad. But yeah, this thing, I'm curious to see when people get their hands on production models how well it performs, because. That's a lot of image data, and apparently more megapixels still matters because they're still building them. I mean, you know, he went on for at length in that press release about how they um, make like half the image sensors on Earth. Hey, Grant, uh, just chatting for a minute here about that hot rod uh, new Sony camera Sony launched today, that A7R4 that's got like a 60 megapixel sensor in it. 
Hey. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> We're going to have Bass Man in here in a minute. Bass Angler's going to be throwing down the Nikon gauntlet. <laughs> You'd have to tape two D850s together to get that many megapixels. <laughs> ah. Philadelphia was incredible. I gotta admit, I really enjoyed Philadelphia with the, where we was at, we was out in a little town called King of Prussia. And it's about 35, 40 minutes northwest of downtown Philadelphia. And then right next door to it was the little town called Bridgeport that the competition at Sierra was in was actually in. So we would travel back and forth. It was only about a five minute drive between those two communities. Like this enormous mall. It, it was a really nice area where we was at. It really was. But we spent a bunch of time there. We went out to Valley Forge, saw that. Yeah, it is. It's actually a really nice place. The roads got enormous potholes that I could like hide a car in. But um, they're pretty. It's pretty nice. And then let's see here. We didn't do any of the tours in downtown. I just didn't want to fool with the whole waiting in line. The Liberty Bell building is a long building. It's apparently got a bunch of like historical artifacts in it down to the bell being at the very end. And that they had the building closed. So they were queuing people up in a line on the sidewalk to actually look through a little arrow slit window at the end so you could see apparently where the crack is in the bell through a window. And people were standing in line for that. I, I took some pictures of the people. I actually got a piece of footage of all the people in line. I did like a flyby with my GoPro all the way up to the front. But there's a reason I haven't built a video yet too. That's another story we'll get to in just a minute. Hold that thought. I'll do a Hugh Brownstone on you. <laughs> but, um, so, but what we found out was if you walk around the crowd to the street in between Independence Hall and that building that the bell's in, and you look back in the end, there's a huge window in the end of the building, and the bell's right there. You can see it without having to stand in line. Just walk around to the end, look across it. They have a few shrubs planted in front of the building. You just look right over and see it. It's a pretty big bell. It was, it was pretty big, but I didn't have to, I didn't feel compelled to stand in line to look at a broken bell. <laughs> and then Independence Hall was kind of awe-inspiring. You know, it's right there on the other side. But I turned around. And you can't cross the street. The National Park Service and the city of Philadelphia have officers all around that building. And, and they'll only let you get on the mall side of the street. They won't let you step across the street. The moment you start across, they're, in, they're on you. They're like, turn around, get back. They won't let you get on that side of the street anymore, except where the tour goes in. They queue people up down on the end in one of the antechamber areas, and they take you in and... I had a friend who did it, and he said they set you down, let you watch a little video, and then they walk you into Independence Hall, and you actually go inside. But I didn't do that part. We were more interested in just spending time with friends and seeing the entire area. But, yeah, we went on down there and seen the big customs building down the street, and we ate at um, a really interesting little Korean place. I got a few really cool street photos. I posted a couple of them on Instagram. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna put a video together of the photo walk, a video of a lens I was reviewing. I've got that footage in the can. I've got, I did that little quickie review of the bracketing in the Fuji. I done it while Sierra was climbing at a local climbing gym after the competition was over. I got a few photos of the competition, but it was pretty good, man. It was real busy. And then the flights got screwed up and we didn't get home till like 2 a.m. Tuesday. <laughs> Let's see what I've got here. All right. I'm going to get back on these comments you guys have been writing in. Marks wrote in and said, and he said, oh, let see what he said. He says, feel like Canon's behind with everything they do, but I'm still looking forward to the next EOS R, R, X, R Pro, or whatever it's called. Oh, yeah, the the 1DX Mark II replacement. That, that's going to be a nice machine. Kelly, I use Sony, but don't buy into the hype Nikons. Or great camera. <laughs> hey, Axe, how you doing? Glad you dropped in. Well, things have changed there. It was not like that in 06 when I was there. looking. <laughs> oh, no. Bass Angler's done come on. 
<laughs> oh, but I get home Tuesday night. And we and we get home and well, of course it's two a.m. So we come in and just crash and go to sleep. And I can't sleep past seven the next morning. So I go ahead and get up, <laughs> go to work, get done with that day. I come up here to start offloading all the memory cards because I've got quite a few cards with photos and videos on them, and the computer won't turn on. I've got a PC that I've been using that's got like a accelerated video card in it so I can actually edit video in a reasonable time. Wouldn't power up at all. Just wouldn't power up. So I mess around with it and I unplug all the plugs and take the tower and open it up. And nothing's obviously damaged. I, I was worried that, the that lightning had ran in on it while we was out of town. So I put it all back together plug in just the power cord, none of the accessories, just to make sure that the tower powered up. Well, it did. So then I plugged the monitor in and plugged all the accessories in, but I couldn't get a display. Mess with it, mess with it, mess with it, mess with it. Couldn't get a daggum display to come on. So I figured the video card's bad. So today after work, I take it back apart. I look at everything again to make sure I'm looking for obvious signs of like burnt traces or, you know, black resistors, you know, something that lightning would have gave me or maybe a cracked epoxy case. Let me get rid of this. Cracked epoxy case on a transistor, something free that make it easy to know what's bad. Can't find anything. So I wiggle all the connectors. See, back in the old industrial maintenance days, corrosion would make those contacts on those little pressure connections like the PCI slots in the computer get slightly corroded and you'd start getting a voltage drop across them wiggle them wiggle them put them all back in boot it up works fine now so i'm offloading cards now <laughs> yeah let's see what i what i missed while i've been telling the story but yeah the, the, i thought i was gonna get a new computer but i got it to come on so i don't get a new one yet Long Rider makes a good point. All right. He says, I hear Canon is also working on that 60 plus megapixel. You, yeah, they probably are. Just feel like they're always second or third. Sony does make a pretty sweet camera. I just can't switch. Uh oh, whoa, what happened? <laughs> You're outnumbered. <laughs> um, he, he might be outnumbered, but unfortunately, Sony made the camera. <laughs> Lest we forget, right over there is an A7 II. <laughs> and it works. I just have to be real careful with it. <laughs> Takes a really good photo when it works. <laughs> I like it for adapted glass. It will overheat. <laughs> yeah. There's going to be a lot of processing issues there. You know, they made the, on the A7 III, they made the grip physically bigger, so the camera's physically larger. You know, it has the battery out of the A9 in it, so there's physically more space there. So I'm assuming they can get more heat sink around, you know, the parts that heat up better. And I'm assuming they're using the chassis as the heat sink. You know, that's why they all use magnesium or aluminum alloy chassis, is because it also doubles as a heat sink. That's why the camera as a whole will get hot when you're doing video with it. But that thing's gonna, you know that now they've got that A9 battery, uh, you're not gonna get more photos. You're gonna get the same amount of photos you got with the old camera that had the little battery. You're just gonna get a super rich file of data. 60 megapixels. Man, I, I'm curious to see what the, I don't wanna call it low light performance because that ain't what I'm interested in. I don't like shooting in the dark. I don't, if I wanted a night vision camera, I'd buy a night vision camera. I'm thinking about, you know, well, maybe flash photography, you know, but um, or like in those climbing gyms where I'm at, the light in there is terrible. So you'll rapidly run out of light and I was running 6400 ISO to get 125th second shutter speeds with the lens run wide open when I was there Saturday or Thursday or Friday, whatever day I went, we was down there and I was shooting. I think it was Thursday I was shooting photos. But yeah, F3.5 and 125th of a second, 
I was having to get 6,400 ISO to get a reasonable exposure. And then it was still probably one third underexposed, one third stop. It's just, they're dim. No matter how they build them, apparently they can't get enough light in them. It looks well lit to the human eye, but I guess your pupils dilate. <laughs> Cause the camera doesn't see it that way. But I'm curious to see if that, you know, that pixel pitch has got to be just tiny tiny pixel pitch so to get enough photons to get a decent exposure i'm curious to see how well they done it with this because you know they haven't they've been sitting on it on purpose they've had it for a while we all know they have they've just been refining it since everybody's been dropping all these cool cameras and they've been wanting to come out with something that would straight blow everything else out of the water you know that's why they did it so it's it may have heating issues but it probably isn't half baked I gotta give them credit. And this ear itches. I think that same mosquito that bit me on the back of the leg got back of my ear. So I'm constantly. <laughs> but that thing, I'm curious to see how it performs. Cause you know, it's gonna have performance specs that rival the A9. And the price is getting close to the A9. So I don't see the value in buying an A9 at this point. You know, the that new one's what? I think it was MSRP at thirty five hundred dollars. So if it's thirty five MSRP street price on, it's probably going to be thirty two, three grand, and you're basically getting a nine performance out of it for what thousand fifteen hundred dollars less. So I don't see why you'd buy the a nine now. I just don't see it. And. I just don't know. Yeah, and it has, see, Longrider just said supposedly it's got the A9 focus system, and I bet it does. You know they borrowed a lot of that tech. Use that as the, as the launch point where they built the camera from, basically. It, it's got the battery out of the A9 for sure, and it, it does. I mean, as a spec sheet goes, it's got some pretty cool specs. I, I read over the rough specs on it, and... It was pretty impressive. When I saw that 60.1 megapixel backside illuminated CMOS, and then it had a whole bunch of other letters I didn't recognize. <laughs> Bass Angler says a D850 will still whip its butt. <laughs> I don't know. Depends on the glass. Yeah, that rolling shutter thing. And especially with 61 megapixels, you know that the scan rate can only be so fast or you're going to get heating a lot of heating you're going to have to have a lot of processing power number one and your scan rate is going to have to be you know rocket ship speeds yeah like you said the bigger pixel pitch in the d850 makes it easier to a one not get hot and two scan faster plus it's a knock on <laughs> I don't know if they'll make another DSLR as far as a um, D850 slash D5 category. I don't know that they'll make two, you know, jumping over to the Nikon count for a minute. I've been looking at that pretty hard and wondering if I should skip a generation because that's what I did when I, when I got the D810 was when I bought my D7000 and I messed with it a while, the D800s came out, and you know, they had the 800, 800E, and then the D810. So I waited on that, um, that D810 before I jumped on board with that. I don't see me really gaining a lot by getting a D850 if I give it a year or so and uh, the D860 or D870 or whatever comes out it makes the D850 look like, you know, chop suey or something. <laughs> yeah, the D5 is pretty well done, I believe. I think they're going to work a mirrorless counterpart to the D5, and they're just going to eliminate it altogether. I really think, I really think, from a business standpoint that they're going to want to slowly but surely move everybody over to the mirrorless design because they're cheaper to build. 
They're just simpler cameras to manufacture. Everything about them are is simpler to manufacture because there's a lot less moving parts. And if you look at it from a strictly business perspective, people, people really don't care as much about whether it's a DSLR or a mirrorless camera anymore. That, this generation is, you know, we're kind of hung up on that mirror moving out of the way, but the generation predating us, they didn't have them. They had range finders, you know? And so the whole single lens reflex design has basically pretty close to ran its course. You're gonna see, I think, a slow transition over to, uh, to a mirrorless camera. And it wouldn't surprise me if they start having SSDs built into them so you don't have to buy memory cards for them. That'll have better write speeds than external memory. <laughs> Mark and mad at the millennials. I really think it's moving there because the cameras are lighter, they're smaller. The image quality is there if you use them correctly. There's some applications where they don't perform as well, but I think they'll start making lower megapixel count ones just for that application segment. You know, like they already do. They already make a, you know, what is it? The Z6 and the Z7. They're deliberately two different megapixels for that reason because, you know, with the Z6, the rolling shutter isn't as bad because you don't have as many megapixels. The scan rate's faster. Yeah, like Mark said, using their iPhone 7s. I mean, they're really, they are. And that that's choking off that market and that cost to manufacture. Even, even the D3500, them D3000 series families and D5000 series family cameras, they're not cost effective to manufacture. If you can build that camera and eliminate that whole mirror sim system. Just get it completely out of the camera and put a little tiny TV in the top for your eye to look at and instead of all of that optical crap and that pentaprism and all that. It'll make it way cheaper to manufacture. That's where they're struggling, if I had to guess, is to get the cost of the little OLED display and get it to with a diopter adjustment like Fuji. And they're probably reverse engineering an X-T3 as we speak because it works really well. <laughs> you know? And once they can figure out how to, how to build that cheaper than all that other mech, I think you'll start seeing those entry-level cameras disappearing. I really do. I think they'll start phasing them out and they'll, just, they'll make the, like the ESRP. It's, just, it's, it's headed that way. It just is. Yeah, that's why, yeah, he, um, he makes a good point. Axe says, um, he says, you can't imagine the amount of money you'd have to invest in memory cards for a 50 plus megapixel camera. I really think they're gonna start coming with SSDs at some point. Uh, somebody else I watched uh, probably a couple months ago, they had a wish list camera. I think it was Tony Northrup, you know, and I believe he said that uh, he, his vision of a future camera would probably be one that had built-in memory so you didn't have to buy memory cards and it had, you know, an SSD in it, a solid state hard drive, maybe three or four terabytes built into the camera. Hey, Eric, thank you for stopping by. And then what you would do is you would either upload them through Wi-Fi out of the camera, Bluetooth out of the camera, or cable them in, you know, with USB-C and just port them over like that. And that way you don't have to buy cards and you don't have to worry about card failures, you know, because solid state drives are pretty robust. And, and even at that, you could possibly get removable hard drives. And but at that point you could have, you could have, yeah. Mark says he's using Synology for storage. 10 terabytes is going to fill up pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. Axe says, just looked at my, his two M2 SSDs and they're tiny. And they're getting smaller really quick. I, yeah, I think it's just a matter of time before you see that, I really do. I mean, the, the memory in this iPhone that I'm using today is what, it's half a, half a terabyte, 512 gigabytes of memory in an iPhone. And yeah, when you see the memory chip, it's tiny. 
So it's just, yeah, I can see them building it into the camera. Because under most normal shooting conditions for the prosumer or the consumer who just wants a nice camera that takes different lenses, you know, the, the 3000 series people, the 5000 series people, you could literally put a terabyte of memory in them and then eliminate eliminate the, the, the door for the memory card port, eliminate the port, eliminate all of that circuitry and just make it permanent, solder it in. Just like Apple started soldering in their RAM. They did that not to keep you from changing it, but to simplify manufacture to save money. By doing that, it eliminated that whole socket assembly and that's, that eliminated cost, made that cheaper to manufacture. Just solder that daggum memory stick straight to the motherboard and move on with your day. Then someone said, hey, we don't need the memory stick. We just need the memory chips. So they eliminated the stick. You know, it, that was just, that was a manufacturing cost savings move is what that was. Some engineer was, ta was tasked with saving money in the memory department. And that's how he did it. He eliminated that. The socket and the little circuit boards of memory zone. And he said, well, why don't we just solder them straight to the board and eliminate this crap? It'll also make the computer lighter and thinner. That was a no-brainer for Apple. That's exactly why they done it. And I can see them doing that with these, with those entry-level cameras. I mean, like we said, the I, an iPhone's got 512 gig built in, and I have yet to fill it up. I mean, even get close. And I've been lazy at times and have 2,000 videos on this phone at once. It, it's a marathon to go through and delete those videos. So it's, yeah, I can see it heading that way. And then I really don't, I really don't know why an icon makes a 3,000 family, 5,000 family, a 7,000 family, and then you got the intermediate prosumer cameras. You know, you got your 610, your 750, your 850, and then a D5. That's a large amount of products. I mean, you got them, them three full frames when you could combine those. I really don't see the real value in between, you know, going from a 610 to 750 to an 850. In my mind, they'll combine them at some point. That'll be your Z7, you know. And then they'll have a pro camera that'll have the built-in battery grip. You know, it'll all be one big, huge camera. It'll look a lot more like that Olympus OMDX1347ZL, <laughs> question mark. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but, yeah, I see it heading that way. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, Axe said it best. The three and five thousand, and even the seven thousand series, are to get your foot in the door in their system. And once you're, once you're in, you're invested in their lenses. And once you're invested in their lenses, they've got you. You know, someone who was it earlier said that they couldn't go over because they had too many lenses. Somebody's got Canon glass that checked in earlier. I don't, they may not still be with me now on this particular stream, but. At the beginning of the stream, game over. Hell, <laughs> yeah, they've got you then. That's, that, that's the truth. But someone said they couldn't switch to Sony because they have too much canning glass. You know. So with these cameras getting smaller, are people adding battery grips just for size? I add the battery grip for batteries. The Fuji X-T3 battery grip has two batteries in it. And you can leave the battery in the camera so you have three batteries in the camera physically. So I never have to change batteries in the field at all. I shoot all day and it runs down maybe two. Maybe. So that's why I like the battery grip. I've taken it off of the X-T3 and the camera is small and your little finger doesn't fit. What can I say? It's a little bird singing to me. But... <laughs> And I used it and it worked fine, but I don't like having just one battery in the camera. I like the, the redundancy of multiple batteries. That's why I like the grip. And it does give me that vertical shooting, although I must admit with the X-T3, the buttons on the battery grip are right here where my little finger are and the web of my palm rubs them. And how long does this take? <laughs> Little Indian. Okay, 
<laughs> but my finger hits the shutter release, so I have to remember to lock that shutter button, which turns off all the buttons on the battery grip, or I'm getting false false positives from those buttons if I'm not careful. Ice cream truck, it was the one little, two little, three little idiot. That was the song I was playing. But <laughs> That's pretty nice with the batteries. Yeah, but that's the reason I like them is it, it allows me that. Which with the D810, the battery grip I bought is a Vivitar. I didn't buy the Nikon, so I don't know if it has two in it. But the the the, the Vivitar battery grip has a single rechargeable tray, and then a, it has a double A tray, so you can. Um, you can actually put one in the camera and have one in it, so it'll run two batteries at once on the on the D810 with the grip, and it and it recognizes that there's two batteries there when you do that. It shows both batteries. It's like the the XT3 shows three batteries. It's, yeah, um, it calls them L and R, and I don't remember what the other one is, but you see them. It's got little battery meters. It shows the amount of charge on all three of them, and it always draws off the left grip battery till it's dead first then it moves to the right grip battery, then it moves to the internal one. It's kind of weird, but it always discharges that left battery first, so I always switch them in the tray when I charge. If I run them both down, that way I don't just cycle one to death and not the rest of them. Let's see, I missed something here. You took your grip off your A7R2 for the same reason? Yeah, I mean, um, Thought on the Canon 7D Mark II. Canon makes a, a Nate Pushweight says he asked about the Canon 7D Mark II. Ooh, is that is it sitting still yet? There we go. Uh, I've never shot with the 7D Mark II. I have shot with the 6D. I think that's the new one with the with the touch screen. I've shot with the um, one or two of the little Rebels um, that friends have. And uh, and a five, the five D Mark two or three. It was fairly old, but they all work really well. They're all great cameras. Canon makes a great product. Their cameras take really good pictures. You can you can see lots of photographers earning a good living with Canon photography equipment. I mean, they make a, they make a good product. I just don't personally have any of it, other than no. I don't even think I have a Canon film camera at this time. I'm thinking. I don't think I do. I don't have any uh, Canon photography equipment whatsoever. I have a friend who's got an old AE-1. Oh, it don't have a flip-out screen? Huh. Oh, my favorite lens? It varies um, from month to month, but I would say probably the... Um, the 105 F2 DC for portraiture and the 105 F 2.5 AIS lens is probably real high. It's in the bag right now. It goes everywhere I do. I'm gonna check something right quick. Y'all don't go anywhere because I'm stepping right here and going right back. happening here are we back I think we're back let's see yeah um, it says we're back <laughs> we got uh, we had technical difficulties it dropped the connection but yep okay <laughs> I shoot a lot of environmental. I've gotten really heavy in the street lately. I like to shoot street photography. Now I've done a good bit of street photography in Philadelphia. If you go to my Instagram, I've got a few pictures of some um, some street photos I took. And the last two or three I posted was from that. But let's see, I like some macro. I enjoy shooting. Typically I like to shoot uh, flowers or plant life in macro more than anything else. I guess you could call that still life maybe and then 
that's mostly it. I'm not particularly fond of like wildlife photography, like bass angler is that's in here, because uh, the the time it takes to do it well, I'm just not good. Uh, I'm just not good with spending a lot of time waiting on a good shot. You know, those those bird photographers are patient people. You know, don't get in line behind them at the grocery store because they ain't gonna get upset because the line ain't moving. <laughs> Let's see here. Ah, oh, you're from Philly. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I wish um, we could have linked up. I, I, I put out a video, it's, it's in my videos, about the photo walk I've done, and I, it was an open invite to anybody that wanted to come. I just um, didn't get any takers. But we still had a few people to go. Patience, yeah. Not long exposure and architecture. I like architecture too, I do. If I can find interesting things, yeah, I'm moving the camera around. I'm trying to read what I've missed here. It flips out or down, but it does not swivel like the Canon. Oh, he's talking about the flip out screen. <laughs> but yeah, I'm a more, I prefer telephoto lenses for the most part. 100 millimeter to 200 millimeter is my preferred lens range. But uh, with street photography, I like on the Fuji, I like an 18 millimeter because I use the kit lens for my photo walk and it worked really well at 18 millimeters. Getting lots of people up close, you can get action and people can be fairly close and you can still capture it with the 18 millimeters. So I used it a lot. That 18 to 55 worked really well. It's actually a really good lens. I've got a review of that lens in the can as well. Once I can get the computer to do some editing. Hopefully later this week one day I'll get to do some editing. But I just want to talk for a few minutes about that A7R4, see what you guys thought, because I thought that was pretty interesting, dude. They throw down the gauntlet with a 60 megapixel full frame sensor. Dude, that's, that's dense. That's a lot of pixels in a little bitty space. It's a bunch of photosides. So I'm gonna have to get over here Bible study starts in about 20 minutes and I got to go down to the church to meet everybody for Bible study. I'm just thinking about, I got a truck. Yeah, I got a way to go. <laughs> so, but I'll have a video in a day or two. So as soon as I can get it edited and get it uploaded, I'll have some content. But I'm going to start plucking out singles from the photo walk and throwing them up on the, throwing them up on the wall since I can do stills on the, on YouTube, give y'all a little bit of insight. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. You take care, too. We'll see y'all later. Bye-bye. Later.